I think we're, hi. <laughs> I think we're going to get started in uh, a minute or two if people just want to take their seats. I'm assuming everyone can hear me okay. And hopefully everyone online can also hear us. Um, thank you everybody so much for joining um, us today, both in person and online. Um, I know we can't really see it, but we did get, um, I think we got a couple hundred RSVPs for online. So really excited um, that we can reach such a wide audience. Um, I'm Heather Williams, I'm the director of the Project on Nuclear Issues I'm here at CSIS, and we're just really thrilled today uh, to launch this book, The Fragile Balance of Terror, uh, co-edited by Scott Sagan and Vipin Narang. Um, Scott's here. Vipin uh, has another job uh, and is uh, busy, doing, um, busy doing other things. Um, but I'm just really thrilled not only that I was able to contribute to the volume, but also that CSIS can host the launch of this. Um, if you haven't already taken a look at it, I would really encourage you to do so. And there's copies outside. It is just an incredibly exciting group of scholars, group of topics, and a really great moment to kind of take a pulse and see how the landscape is changing. And I think that the way that Scott and Vipin have organized things and put this together is just incredibly exciting. Um, so thank you again so much for joining us. A few housekeeping items I do have to go over. Uh, first, this, um, this event is on the record. It is being live streamed and is being recorded. We encourage audience participation, so please feel free to ask questions. For those of you in the room, we will get to a Q&A section, uh, and at that time, you should put your hands up and somebody from the Pony team will bring you a microphone. If you are online, then please use the Q&A function to ask your question, and we will be collecting those and um, feeding them up to the chairs. Um, just a little bit of background about Pony, if you aren't familiar with us. Pony is about to turn 20 years old, which is really exciting. Uh, it was founded in 2003 to develop the next generation of policy, technical, and operational nuclear professionals through outreach, mentorship, research, and respectful debate. We're also really excited because today we're launching our 2023 Nuclear Scholars Initiative. Sorry, I'm going to embarrass you guys. Can you raise your hands if you're here from the Nuclear Scholars Initiative? It's a really great turnout for them. And just um, so... Good timing, really excited this all came together. Um, I also have to share with you our building safety precautions. Overall, we feel secure in this building. Um, but as a convener, we have a duty to prepare for any eventuality. Um, I will be your responsible safety officer. Um, please follow my instructions if the need arises. We don't think the need is going to arise. But um, also just take a minute to check out where your emergency exits are. They're there. Yeah, they're there. Um, and. With that, I think we are ready to get things started. So um, for the first portion of this event, I'm going to hand things over to Scott, um, who's going to, uh, who's the co-editor of the book, book along with Vipin, um, and Scott is going to chair a discussion between some of the authors um, in which we'll talk a little bit about our chapters and findings. And then we'll open it for a discussion, and then that'll be followed by a keynote from Scott. So with that, Scott, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Heather. I'll just speak uh, from, uh, from here. Um, I want to introduce you to the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, who is co who sponsored the book and is co-sponsoring this with CSIS. So thank you, Heather, for hosting us um, here. Uh, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences uh, was created in the 1780s, so it wasn't always doing nuclear arms control uh, work. But John Adams and a group of patriots uh, wanted to create an American society similar to the salons that they had seen in France, where scholars, inventors, uh, and others could get together to talk, write, and since that time, the Academy has continued to be um, a place where scholars and practitioners can get together and can talk and can write and can research. In 1960, the Academy published in its Daedalus journal uh, a special issue called arms control, which is basically the invention of the ideas about strategic stability. In 2010, Steve Miller and I co-edited a volume on can we have nuclear power without having nuclear proliferation? Will the spread of nuclear power create new incentives and new opportunities for countries to get nuclear weapons? 2018, Chris Chiba and Bob Legvold edited a special issue of Daedalus uh, on Russian-American relations and nuclear arms control. And Vipin Narang, then at MIT, and I were asked to bring together scholars to talk about the, next na the nature of the next generation of countries 
getting nuclear weapons. What will the nuclear future look like with new technologies and new states? Um, Vipin had to uh, abandon work on the project when he went into the government, um, but uh, uh, his portion of it was done prior to that. Uh, and we're launching this today because the American Academy very kindly, coupling with Cornell University Press, has made this book um, uh, free online to get uh, open access to it, which is wonderful. Uh, today we're going to have a panel of three of the uh, chapter authors uh, speaking. I'm going to give the barest of introductions so that they can uh, jump right in because you want to hear from them, not hear uh, about them. So our first uh, speaker uh, will be Ankit Panda from the Carnegie uh, Endowment for International Peace, right around the corner, who will talk about the chapter that he wrote with Jeffrey Lewis uh, and uh, update it from when he wrote it uh, and give examples from North Korea and elsewhere. Then Heather Williams will talk about the chapter that she wrote with Viv Narang on social media and what is the difference between potential crises today in a very different communication and media environment than the ones that we all studied uh, in an earlier period. Uh, Heather, as you know, is here at CSIS and heads the Pony program. And then Nick Miller would be our third speaker, talking about a chapter that he wrote with Mark Bell. Nick is uh, a professor at Dartmouth, and Mark Bell is a professor at the University of Minnesota. And many scholars have written about nuclear learning, how Russia and the United States learned from past crises about how to behave in a safer and more secure way. And Nick and Mark challenge whether new countries will experience the same kind of nuclear learning that perhaps the major powers did during the Cold War. So without further ado, let's turn it over to you. Great. Uh, thank you, Scott. It's, it's good to be here at CSIS to launch this terrific volume. Uh, let me just echo Heather's comments. I think uh, it's, it's now becoming more and more common to hear that we've entered a new nuclear age or a third nuclear age, and I think this volume very nicely tees up many of the questions that we'll be thinking about, not just in the context of the new nuclear states, but even in the context of many of the older states and the future of arms control, so on and so forth. So um, I think Scott's already teed up uh, what I'm gonna talk about quite nicely. Um, so the fundamental idea that Jeffrey and I were asked to interrogate uh, is how do new nuclear states reason about questions of sufficiency when it comes to operationalizing nuclear deterrence, sizing up their nuclear postures. Um, and of course, in the case of most new nuclear states, the three cases we focus on, of course, being India, Pakistan, and North Korea. Uh, we should be thankful that the N on new nuclear states continues to be still quite small. Um, these countries are also contending with acute uh, resource constraints, in many cases, um, normative aspirations, particularly in the, con in the con uh, context of India. Um, and fundamentally, the idea that we juxtapose at the start uh, is an age-old debate uh, in, in, uh, in the field of nuclear strategy, which is, uh, is deterrence, as Schelling once argued, um, primarily contingent on the threat that leaves something to chance. And even the idea of uncertain retaliation with a nuclear weapon can have powerful deterrent effects, precisely because nuclear weapons are the terrible tools of destruction that they are. Or, as Albert Wohlstetter once argued famously, in a way that had significant implications for American nuclear thinking during the Cold War, is the balance of terror indeed delicate? And what we end up finding is, is interesting, uh, which is that new nuclear states, for reasons of necessity, but also reasons of, I think, deeply held beliefs about what deters their adversaries, will early on tend to appear to agree with Schelling. That once they have developed a nuclear device, they've sufficiently tested it, they have sufficient means of delivery, usually ballistic missiles, uh, in the case of the three cases we study, although India and Pakistan did eventually begin with air power and air-delivered weapons. Um, at some point, the push for increasingly larger nuclear forces uh, is moderated by a belief that one's adversary will be deterred through the dramatic effects of nuclear weapons alone. But what we also find is that over time, um, this belief begins to change as the requirements for what it takes to deter shift, as military organizations begin to influence debates within these countries. Uh, and in some cases, of course, we have better insight to internal debates than others, North Korea being a notable exception where it's very difficult to scrutinize the internal strategic debates that might be driving North Korean decision making. 
Um, but over time, we do begin to observe that the new nuclear, uh, that the new nuclear states begin to behave a lot more like the old ones. Uh, and so they do begin to agree that the balance of terror is more like a garden that needs to be actively tended to, that, that there is something of a, of a delicate balance of terror that requires more thinking about the types of delivery systems that are available, countermeasures for coping with ballistic missile defense. Um, and in the case of North Korea, just to bring this to our contemporary world and the policy relevant angle, I think we've seen this rather amply since about January 2021, when Kim Jong-un at the Eighth Party Congress of the Workers' Party of Korea delivered a 13,000-word uh, speech on military modernization and nuclear modernization in which he outlined ambitions for ICBMs with multiple warheads, tactical nuclear weapons, hypersonic glide vehicles, long-range cruise missiles, uh, a whole set of capabilities that he did not have in November 2017 when after three tests of an ICBM that year, Kim declared his deterrent complete. Um, that's what Kim Jong-un said in November 2017 before turning to diplomacy with the United States. Um, so this, I think, gets at one of the fundamental debates uh, in, our, in our field, which is uh, to, to what extent do nuclear weapons deter merely through their presence in a crisis? Um, those of you who have been following many of the debates here in the United States about what our policy response ought to be towards a country like North Korea are likely familiar with many of the technical debates that regularly happen about, well, the North Koreans have tested their ICBMs three times, but these aren't reliable. Do their reentry vehicles really work? Will they penetrate the Earth's atmosphere to successfully detonate a thermonuclear weapon on Los Angeles or New York or Washington? And if the answers to these questions are probably not, or even probably yes, is that sufficient to deter the United States from attacking North Korea? Kim Jong-un is betting yes. Kim Jong-un is betting that even this threat of uncertain retaliation, this threat that leaves something to chance, even a 20% probability that a single ICBM launch from North Korea will successfully detonate a warhead on American soil is sufficient to deter. Um, the United States might have a different view, partly due to our own institutional pathologies, our history of thinking about what it takes to deter. For instance, when we evaluate the reliability of our own strategic deterrent systems, we often hold ourselves to very different standards. Uh, the Trident D-5 missile has seen 180-plus successful flight tests consecutively. It is the most reliable missile system ever developed by man. Um, for countries outside of the United States, there is no comparable analog, but yet we see decision makers really seldom question the efficacy and the credibility of their own deterrence. I do want to briefly talk about South Asia, which is a considerable focus of the case study that Jeffrey and I undertake in our chapter. Uh, South Asia is a really interesting case because you have the benefit of scrutinizing really three periods uh, through the countries, through the two countries' history uh, in the nuclear age. You have the period of nuclear, uh, nuclear latency and development, the period of recessed deterrence broadly from the late 1980s until their uh, breakouts in May 1998. And since 1998, you have, of course, uh, the uneasy coexistence between India and Pakistan. And throughout this period, um, the factors that actually drive internal debates and decision making in both countries, both among military organizations and political leaders, uh, are largely not influenced by technical factors, uh, which I think is quite interesting. India, I think, presents an interesting case study in this regard. Uh, one of India's uh, nuclear devices detonated in May 1998, uh, a thermonuclear device, is thought to have fizzled. Uh, and, and we know this quite authoritatively because senior Indian officials involved in the nuclear test in 1998 uh, later, much later, clarified that the device had fizzled. And so there has been a debate within India about the need to potentially resume nuclear testing. Uh, but yet in public, uh, no Indian policymakers, decision makers, uh, civilians who authorize, of course, assertive control over India's nuclear weapons publicly express any doubts about the quality uh, and the efficacy of India's nuclear deterrent. Um, so these technical debates that sometimes do occur can be, can be handled differently by different domestic constituencies within the country. Uh, we also find interesting evidence that uh, when India did decide to test a nuclear device in May 1998, the Indians went first before the Pakistanis. Uh, Indian political leaders and decision makers at the time had a belief that Pakistan would not follow with nuclear tests of its own in just a matter of days. And that actually influenced how India proceeded to make that decision about nuclear testing, which of course was also influenced by normative considerations around the, the opening for signature of the CTBT in 1996. The, the ossification of the normative nuclear order with the indefinite extension of the NPT, so on and so forth. So India, I think, presents a case where you have a variety of considerations pulling uh, at decision makers. 
So let me now close by talking a little bit about, I think, what some of the policy implications uh, of, of our findings are here. Um, questions of sufficiency, I think, are really bespoke to, to each of the cases. India, Pakistan, and North Korea, I think it's very difficult to generalize apart from the observation that initially these states tend to believe that uncertain retaliation, the threat that leaves something to chance, is a sufficient basis for nuclear deterrence. What this, I think, tells us, uh, especially for deterring, let's say, determined proliferators in the future, is that because many of these proliferators will be willing to accept lower levels of technical reliability than, let's say, we might accept here in the United States, uh, it might be more difficult to, uh, to deter these proliferators through norms against, let's say, nuclear testing, through export controls, supply constraints, um, because proliferators will be willing to tolerate extremely low levels of reliability. I think we had these concerns with other cases like Saddam Hussein's Iraq, where, let's say, Iraqi delivery systems were not quite as sophisticated as Saddam might have liked, but had Iraq succeeded with developing a nuclear device, Iraq would also have been able to pose a similarly minimally reliable threat of retaliation uh, against, uh, against at least certain countries, if not the United States. Um, North Korea, specifically, I think, will continue to represent a formidable deterrence challenge. I, that shift I described in North Korea towards a belief that now, as Kim Jong-un just said on New Year's Day this year, that North Korea will like to exponentially increase the number of warheads that, that it possesses. Uh, I would take that comment seriously, but not literally. Um, but the North Koreans are going to continue to increase the size of their nuclear forces, the sophistication of their delivery systems in ways that will pose significant challenges to the United States. Um, the North Koreans, I think today, have something akin to what we might call uh, a secure second strike in the sense that the United States no longer possesses a capability with a high degree of confidence to comprehensively disarm the North Koreans. Uh, mountainous terrain, mobile missile launchers, lake basing for underwater missiles, which is again something the North Koreans have started looking into, uh, a more mature sea-based nuclear force, more responsive missiles. Uh, as North Korea begins to move towards an understanding of its own nuclear forces that does treat the balance of terror as slightly more delicate than it might have been in 2017, uh, the challenges for U.S. planning and policy, I think, are quite significant. Uh, because if we do accept this premise that we can no longer take for granted that in a conflict we would have any assurance of our ability to disarm North Korea to the extent where North Korea would not be able to release nuclear weapons against our allies or our homeland, that significantly affects how an American president might make a decision. Uh, and, and that decision might be different than it might have been in 2017 when, let's say, in a crisis, the president receives military and intelligence expert advice that North Korean retaliation is on the order of 10 to 20 percent. That's the odd that we would give it. We'd get, we'd get most of the ICBMs, but one of them might take off, and if it does launch successfully, the probability it would make it, that everything would work, stage separation, RV survival, is on the order of that number. Um, so that, I think, represents a, a significant shift. I think this is fundamentally what the North Koreans are seeking to do. And of course, I think in any nuclear crisis, uh, a, a rational uh, president of the United States seeking all possible information that he or she might uh, will look to have uh, as, high of an as high of an assurance that either conventional or military operations against another state's nuclear forces are likely to succeed. Uh, so the North Koreans, I think, are, are operating according to this principle. Uh, so let me just close with this thought, which is that I think um, when we think about future proliferators, new nuclear states more generally, this shift, uh, the, the original understanding of the dramatic effects of nuclear weapons, the, the threat that leaves something to chance, having powerful deterrent effects, uh, that does tend to drive initial procurement, the initial shaping of nuclear forces, choices even about command and control. Um, but over time, uh, like I said earlier, the new nuclear states begin to look a lot more like the older ones. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Anke. Heather, over to you. Thank you so much, Scott, um, for the invitation to be on this panel, but also the invitation to contribute um, to the volume. Um, I wrote a chapter with Vipin uh, called Thermonuclear Twitter, and we actually started this project before the pandemic, and so seeing how it's evolved over all this time and the role of social media has been uh, thrilling and exciting. Um, but so uh, what our, pro what our um, chapter was really inspired by was uh, what we saw as some crisis tweeting by a number of world leaders. And what we wanted to do was to offer a deeper understanding of social media during crises and really try to provide a more granular approach to this. Just a quick observation. Social media, but I think also issues of emerging technology, 
it's such a vast issue that actually finding a way to approach these in a structured and logical way can be really challenging. So I'm actually going to start off by saying a little bit about our research questions um, on the role of social media during crises and how we approach this. Uh, I'll then give a summary of our three case studies. And the case studies were the 2019 Pulwama Bell Cot crisis, which involved WhatsApp and Facebook. I'll then say a bit about the 2018 Hawaii missile alert, which was sent by a text message, but then there was a lot of Facebook follow-ups. Uh, and then end with the 2017 um, uh, in uh, Korea when there was a fake evacuation order that was sent from the USFK uh, Facebook page when it got hacked. Um, and then I'm gonna wrap up with some policy uh, implications and I'll also make some observations about social media um, during the Ukraine crisis as that's evolved since we did the first draft. Um, but to just kind of give you up front what one of our main findings was, there's a lot of nuanced findings in the chapter, so I really would encourage people to check out the book um, and get into those little details. But our main finding, it seems really simple, but it is important and worth stating, different social media platforms can work at cross purposes. They can work against each other in crises, um, and this makes a uniform effect difficult to understand or measure. And so what we were trying to do with our cases was see, are all social media platforms equal, or how do they behave differently? How do they affect crises differently? Um, what this means is that the social media ecosystem may generate a lot of noise and ambiguity, and that can have effects on crises. It could make crises harder to navigate, um, but it can also provide face-saving options and off-ramps from crises, which I'll talk about. So just uh, to get started on what was our approach to this, as I said, I think any social media, but also emerging tech projects more broadly, your entry point and how you uh, go about this uh, is really, really important. Our research questions were, how have social media platforms affected international politics, particularly crises involving nuclear actors? So that's, that's like the big question. Um, do they trigger crises? Do they serve as rocket fuel for escalation? Or are they just noise that is thickening the fog of war that would be there anyways? Um, but where we got a bit more granular and where I, I hope that we're really making an important contribution is asking how do different platforms affect crisis dynamics? Basically, are WhatsApp and Twitter the same in a crisis? Those are just two of the examples. So our, our framework, um, our starting point was an intentionally measured approach to social media. We did not start off by saying social media is good, social media is bad, it's escalatory, it's de-escalatory, it's stabilizing or destabilizing. We also acknowledge that it could change the outcome of a crisis, but it also might not change the outcome of a crisis. Um, messages can be either intentionally antagonistic or they can be ambiguous. So we really wanted to start as balanced as possible when we went about this. And what we did was we teased out two sets of variables um, that we hypothesized would influence the way social media impacts crises. Uh, the first of these was that the type of platform does matter. Um, is it going to be an open platform like Twitter, right? So if you tweet something for most accounts, anybody can read it. You are engaging with anybody and everybody. It's really free flowing. Uh, or is it going to be a closed platform such as WhatsApp or text messaging where it's a much more isolated group um, and you can control who sees it. It might be going to a single user or to a curated group. So that was the first set of kind of variables that we wanted to look at during crises. Um, the second group was that the nature of the crisis also matters. Is the crisis short? Is the crisis long? Is it um, domestic crisis? Is it international? Um, so like, uh, you know, we wrote this when I was still an academic, and so obviously we made a really good two by two, uh, which we applied to our case studies. Um, I don't really do that anymore, but it was fun when we did it. So um, our cases, uh, I already kind of told you what they were, uh, but we really picked these because they involved uh, a nuclear actor. They had a nuclear component, but they also had a lot of variation. Um, they had variation in what type of crisis it was, how long it lasted, uh, also variation in which social media platforms came into play. And so, with, and so with that, I'll tell you about them in a bit more detail. So first uh, case study we looked at was 2019 Pulwama Balakot. I'm not going to go into the minute details um, of the crisis, but just to summarize, this was a crisis over two weeks between India and Pakistan following a terrorist attack on local police forces in Kashmir in which India retaliated with airstrikes, and this was followed by a series of air engagements between Indian and Pakistani forces. There were two main aspects of social media throughout the crisis that I want to flag. The first one were uh, open social media groups, so uh, particularly Facebook 
where you saw a lot of deep fake images and disinformation being spread. One of the most prominent of these was a doctored image of Rahul Gandhi, the head of the Congress party, opposition to the um, BJP party, and it showed Rahul Gandhi meeting with the terrorist who had driven um, a truck or who had um, yeah, dr um, bombed these local police forces. And so suggesting that the head of the opposition party met with the terrorist and somehow was behind these attacks. Um, that was one of the more extreme ones, and it was, it was obviously uh, a doctored image. Um, but then the other social media um, trend was actually on WhatsApp, which is a closed platform. And this is where um, some of the uh, really worst messages were going around. You saw uh, there were a lot of nationalist messages, ra a lot of racist messages. Um, these were highly inflammatory. Um, a personal observation on this, I I've been doing social research on social media and crises for quite a while now. These were by far the most disturbing messages I have ever read um, in terms of social media during crises. They were, um, you know, it, it was threatening to do really, really horrible things in great detail um, and tying it to this crisis. Um, but we saw both open and closed pl platforms were being used. Um, one thing we did find was that on the open platforms, because you're opening it up to such a wider audience, there's almost a self-regulatory effect whereby if you're putting out disinformation or garbage, you're more likely to have people step in and correct that and people who will say, this is clearly a doctored image and trying to, and so you can get a little bit more information that can get you closer to the truth. Um, that doesn't happen on WhatsApp. WhatsApp, the echo chamber stays an echo chamber. Second crisis we looked at was the 2018 Hawaii missile alert. Um, I'm guessing most of you have heard this story, but on January 13th, 2018 at 8.07 a.m. Hawaii time, every single cell phone user in Hawaii got a text message that said, emergency alert, ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii, seek immediate shelter, this is not a drill. It turns out it was a drill, but um, due to human error, um, the message was meant to be tested, and instead it was actually sent. And there was a whole debate afterwards about how this ended up happening. We can go that, into that in the Q&A if anyone wants to go down that rabbit hole. But um, it took 38 minutes for um, the emergency authority that had sent that text message to correct it. So for 38 minutes, you're sitting there with this text message. But during those 38 minutes, social media actually played a really important regulating function because one of the system, one of the emergency system users who was there when this text message was actually sent, that person went on Facebook and posted, I'm paraphrasing, if you got this text message, that's a mistake, there is no incoming missile, something to that effect. Um, and he did that five minutes later, so much faster in saying, this is a drill. And so again, in this case, the open platform was able to reach a, a much wider audience and have that regulatory effect. Um, and then it was also passed on in closed ones. Um, this, um, this incident was particularly troublesome at the time, however, because it came six weeks after a North Korean nuclear test and just 10 days after Donald Trump's, uh, one of Trump's famous comments about having a big red button on his desk. So the context in which the crisis and the social media activity happens, it all, the context really matters. The last case that we looked at was the 20, in 2017, uh, September 2017, a message was sent from the U.S. Forces Korea Facebook account. It was also um, posted, reposted on Twitter. It was also sent as a text message. It was also sent around on WhatsApp. And it was calling for a non-combatant evacuation order. So the families of uh, U.S. forces in Korea were being told, you will have to evacuate. This is often perceived, if that ever happened, that is often perceived as being indicative of an incoming strike or escalating tensions. So again, really escalatory. Um, uh, U.S. forces Korea, they quickly took to Facebook to correct this um, and said that it was an error. But again, the context of the message really matters. Only three weeks before this message went out, um, North Korea had conducted uh, what they claimed was a thermonuclear test. And for months leading up to this, Trump had been talking about sending a quote unquote armada to the Pacific. Um, and he was re this is when he's really upping his rhetoric against Kim. So again, the context, you know, like imagine all this tension in the region, and then you see on Facebook that US forces Korea are being evacuated. It's pretty escalatory, pretty concerning. That incident was the account got hacked. Um, I tried so hard and dug so hard to try to find out who did the hack, and it still is not known. People can make guesses, but 
Anyway, so that's just a quick kind of summary of what our cases were and what we were trying to draw out of them. So what are some implications for this um, and what does it all mean for policy? But also we can look at how social media is being used right now in the ongoing crisis and war in Ukraine. Um, Russia, obviously, um, I think everyone knows, has relied on social media over the past decade to spread disinformation, deep fakes, and to push a variety of false narratives. In the past, this was largely done through troll farms. Um, some great books um, have been actually written about those troll farms in um, St. Petersburg in particular. Uh, and you know, kind of talking to the people who used to work there, really good research, I think. Um, but they seem, Russia seems to be shifting tactics. They are not using troll farms as much as they did previously, particularly in the 2014 Ukraine crisis. Um, another tactic that Russia uses is that it often, it, it, Russia doesn't push a single message necessarily. You know, they might push the message, oh, we've done this because of NATO expansion, NATO is making us do this, but rather Russia is more interested in sowing confusion. They flood the information space with conflicting messages so that you literally feel spun around and you do not know which way is up. You do not know what truth looks like anymore. And in a lot of ways, social media is really ideal for doing that. Various platforms where you can just put out whatever you want and there is no regulatory effect. Um, so Russia does this through um, a series and a variety of uh, media platforms and networks. Many, a lot of the time, Russia will set up fake news organizations and then just have them like keep retweeting each other's stories so that they create a whole information ecosystem that serves Russia's, Russia's purposes. Um, a couple interesting twists, I think, in the past uh, few years about uh, social media and Ukraine and what we're seeing there. Um, first, this isn't necessarily about Ukraine, but we are seeing other countries emulate what Russia does and how Russia is using social media. Um, and disinformation, particularly China and Iran. Uh, it seems like the three of them, uh, Russia, Iran, and China, often work to amplify each other's messages. I'm not seeing a lot of evidence that they are colluding with each other or, ha or have a coordinated um, effort, but they certainly amplify each other's messages, they learn from each other's tactics, uh, and Russia often is the, first, is the first mover. Russia is the one that will try something and see how it works, and then China and Iran will learn from it. Um, a second trend that I think this is, I think the way that the Ukrainians and Zelensky are using social media is absolutely fascinating. Um, this is a whole other aspect of social media during crises that Vipin and I didn't look at in the chapter, but Zelensky's team arguably has been very effective at using social media to reach a wider audience, to tell their story, particularly to reach English language audiences. Um, because most of their social media activity is, is in English, so you know who they're trying to reach. But I think some of the most memorable images from the war in Ukraine were in those first few weeks where it was you know, Instagram lives of Zelensky walking around Kyiv to get a coffee. Um, that is a really powerful way to use social media to tell your side of the story. And so that's a whole other aspect of, how, of um, the uh, use of social media during crises that I, I, um, I want to learn more about. Some wider implications, um, all of this is to say, um, I come back to where Vipin and I started. Social media, it's neither good or bad. It's neither escalatory or necessarily de-escalatory, um, but it does have an amplification effect for messages. One of the main findings from our study uh, was that open platforms like Twitter often self-regulate, and they can provide a pathway uh, for the truth to come out and to challenge those disinformation messages. Closed pa platforms uh, often stay as echo chambers without any external inputs. Social media platforms can often work at cross purposes and they end up just creating more noise and ambiguity during a crisis. Um, so what does this all mean for policymakers? Um, in my previous role at King's College London, a colleague and I wrote a study on social, um, it was kind of the precursor to this, and our main takeaway, I've had it quoted back to me, so I'm gonna actually own it and quote it, um, it which was, during a crisis, just stop tweeting for uh, key decision makers, that sometimes just do not say anything, use, the official, use your official channels, give a major speech, and then retweet it. That is something that um, might have a more stabilizing effect. Um, but some governments do choose to shut down social media during crises. Uh, this is a really difficult decision for democracies to make, however. Iran, for example, and China often just fully shut down their social media if a crisis is going on. Iran just shuts off the whole internet, for example. Um, but for the US and US allies, that would be a much harder decision. 
All of this, I think, is to say um, social media is just a new part of the strategic landscape. It is a tool for signaling. It can also be a tool for escalation and de-escalation. Um, and I think it's just one of many factors that is adding to the new complexity and uncertainty that we see um, in the current nuclear landscape. So with that, I think I will stop. Thank you very much, Heather. Thanks. Nick, you're last. Hello, everyone. Uh, it was great, uh, a great honor to be part of <clears throat> such a great group, group of scholars um, working on this volume. Uh, and I'm very excited to have the opportunity to talk to you guys today about uh, some of what we found. So I'm going to be talking about the concept of nuclear learning, uh, building on the chapter that I co-wrote in the volume uh, with Mark Bell from the University of Minnesota. Uh, so let's start with the basics. Um, what do we mean when we say uh, nuclear learning? Basically, this is the idea that over time, uh, states that possess nuclear weapons figure out how to behave kind of safely and responsibly with their arsenals. There are a lot of different varieties of nuclear learning arguments, but the gist is that uh, eventually nuclear powers should come to realize that nuclear weapons are only really useful for deterrence, right? Not for supporting kind of offensive aims. They should take care to avoid accidents and miscalculations. They should try to avoid getting into dangerous crises in the first place. And importantly, they should accept mutual vulnerability with rivals rather than engage in kind of these endless costly arms races uh, in an attempt to gain nuclear superiority. Obviously, in many ways, this is a comforting argument, right? Since it basically suggests all we have to do is get through these kind of temporary periods of danger with new nuclear powers, right? After which they're going to sort of naturally settle into uh, these stable patterns of deterrence, right? To make this more concrete, we might worry that North Korea or maybe a future nuclear armed Iran would pose a lot of challenges initially, right, and behave aggressively or irresponsibly for several years. We don't know exactly how many, but before long, they'll learn kind of the error of their ways and they'll start behaving like uh, a responsible nuclear power. So very kind of nice argument to believe, right? But the question is, how much stock should we really put into these sorts of arguments? Uh, should we really expect North Korea uh, to learn how to safely and responsibly manage its nuclear arsenal and refrain from provoking crises? Uh, unfortunately, based on the research that we did, um, we think these nuclear learning arguments are mostly unpersuasive, right? both on theoretical grounds and historical grounds. Um, in other words, the logic of these arguments is not particularly compelling once you kind of hold it to scrutiny, and there really isn't a ton of historical evidence to support this idea of kind of this linear trend of nuclear states behaving more responsibly over time. Uh, so I'm gonna start by just explaining uh, why we think nuclear learning of this sort uh, is particularly difficult and why it's likely to be even more difficult in this kind of new, more complex nuclear era that we're in. Uh, I'll then dive into uh, two really important historical cases for sort of evaluating this argument. Right? The first is the US-Soviet nuclear competition during the Cold War uh, and India and Pakistan over the last several decades. Uh, and we make the case that um, nuclear learning uh, was very limited in both of these cases. Um, and in fact, in the India-Pakistan case, the trends seem to be almost in the opposite direction from what the arguments predict, right? Where the countries are behaving sort of more aggressively and um, irresponsibly over time. Uh, I'll conclude by kind of briefly talking about uh, what nuclear learning arguments might say about uh, the war in Ukraine and what implications Russia or other countries might draw from that conflict. Okay, so let me begin by uh, explaining why we think this type of nuclear learning uh, is likely to be much more difficult than many scholars have assumed. Uh, the short version is there are a lot of significant obstacles to states learning the stabilizing lessons uh, that these nuclear learning arguments identify. Uh, so why, what are these obstacles? Why do we think it's going to be difficult? First, uh, compared to states that do not possess nuclear weapons, um, nuclear powers arguably face uh, significantly less pressure to learn, right? precisely because of the security provided by their nuclear arsenal. Right? Countries with nuclear weapons might think uh, you know, I'm pretty much immune from regime change, I'm pretty much immune from conquest, or maybe major conventional attacks in general. Right? This may lead them uh, to run greater risks in their foreign policy, um, in a similar way that you know, having a seatbelt in a car might make you drive faster, right? or more recklessly, right? because you know you're protected from some of the consequences of your actions. So that's one obstacle. The second uh, is that militaries often have major influence over nuclear weapons programs, um, and there's a lot of research showing they're susceptible to a number of different biases, uh, such as groupthink or a preference for offensive uh, doctrines, which may encourage you know, more risky first-use postures uh, and may encourage uh, sort of a drive for nuclear superiority 
um, rather than accepting uh, mutual vulnerability. Third, uh, nuclear programs are often very much shrouded in secrecy. Uh, this impedes the open flow of information, impedes the sort of um, fulsome debate that might be necessary to kind of settle on the smarter, more stabilizing policies uh, that nuclear learning arguments expect. Um, as uh, Rose McDermott's chapter in our volume suggests, uh, this might be kind of exacerbated in the case of personalist regimes, right? Where you have kind of one strong man controlling the government by and large, right? Leaders like Kim Jong-un might be kind of especially resistant to learning uh, because they're typically surrounded by yes men, right? And they're not getting accurate information on a regular basis, right? And that, that would make it even harder to kind of learn, learn the right lessons about how to structure their nuclear policy. Fourth, uh, the effect of nuclear weapons on international relations or even on kind of the trajectory or outcomes of specific conflicts is often very ambiguous, right? And that means multiple different lessons can be inferred from those conflicts uh, by different actors, right? Um, scholars like myself, right, we spend decades trying to explain the impact of the nuclear balance, for example, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? We spend decades debating whether the atomic bombing of Japan actually ended the war, right, or whether it was something else. Right? We spent decades arguing about whether nuclear threats ended the Korean War, right, and we still don't have consensus, right? Given this ambiguity, it seems quite unreasonable to expect that leaders will consistently draw the so-called right lessons about nuclear weapons that favor stability, right? They might draw divergent lessons, some of which favor stability, some of which do not. Uh, fifth, and this is related, it's possible, right, and maybe even likely that states will learn the quote unquote wrong lessons about nuclear weapons, right? In other words, they may come to believe nuclear weapons actually are useful for helping to backstop you know, aggression or conquest. They might come to believe nuclear superiority actually provides advantages in crises, right, and gets your adversary to back down. They might also come to believe that nuclear arms racing, uh, rather than being destabilizing, is actually a very effective means of geopolitical competition. Right, and maybe you can help convince your adversary to kind of spend themselves into uh, economic crisis. We think these obstacles are all likely to be exacerbated in this new nuclear area, era that we're entering. Right? So if you think about the Cold War, uh, it was dominated by this bilateral nuclear competition right, between the US and Soviets. Uh, the United States and the Soviet Union were geographically quite distant. Right? They were you know, roughly equal in power, uh, and they were both relatively stable uh, politically. The new nuclear era looks quite different, obviously, right? Uh, we have much more complex multilateral nuclear competitions, uh, which are only becoming more salient over time, right? Think about the United States having to deal with China, uh, Russia, and North Korea and their nuclear arsenals simultaneously. Or think about you know, South Asia, uh, where you have India having to worry about Chinese uh, and Pakistani nuclear weapons at the same time. Um, as uh, Caitlin Talmadge's chapter in our volume highlights, uh, this is likely to increase the odds of arms racing, right, in these sort of uh, trilateral or multilateral nuclear competitions, and potentially dangerous uh, miscalculations and crises. Uh, another aspect of the new nuclear era that might kind of make it harder for states to learn these stabilizing lessons uh, is secrecy is probably going to be even more paramount than it was before, right, and that's because we have a much more robust and developed nonproliferation regime, right, and so countries that are trying to develop nuclear weapons or get them outside the NPT, uh, have a strong incentive to kind of keep things under wraps, right, to avoid the sort of coercive pressures they might face from the international community. We also have technological change that's occurring, right, that a lot of people have argued uh, is making counterforce first use po postures more feasible, right, so that again would uh, push states in the direction of uh, more risky uh, nuclear doctrines that are kind of the opposite of what these nuclear learning arguments uh, would suggest, right, so this new era that we're entering, uh, it may be even more difficult for states to learn uh, the right lessons. Okay, that sounds pretty scary, right? But I'm just giving you kind of logical reasons to sort of doubt these arguments. But we still could be wrong, right? It might be the case that in spite of all those obstacles historically, nuclear powers actually have learned and be behaved more responsibly over time. Uh, unfortunately, we don't think the history really bears that out, right? If you look at these two rivalries, which are probably the most consequential nuclear rivalries that we've witnessed, right? The US versus the Soviet Union uh, and India and Pakistan, we see at best limited evidence of uh, this sort of nuclear learning actually taking place. Uh, the India-Pakistan case 
is especially sobering, as I kind of hinted at at the outset, since it's basically showing us the inverse or the opposite of what nuclear learning arguments expect. Both of these countries actually started with relatively relaxed nuclear postures, um, and in uh, the ensuing decades, they kind of moved in the opposite direction. Right? And they also uh, were taking much greater risks um, in conflicts and crises with each other. Um, Pakistan, in particular, appears to have learned uh, that nuclear weapons can facilitate aggressive behavior, while India seems to be coming around to the idea that its own nuclear weapons can help them take greater risks and prevail in the crises uh, that Pakistan may be provoking. Right? In other words, Pakistan and India clearly have learned lessons, right? but they are not the stabilizing ones that these nuclear learning arguments expect. So let me start uh, by talking a little bit about the US-Soviet case. I should say at the outset here, I don't want to oversell what we're finding here. There is some evidence of nuclear learning um, during the Cold War between the superpowers. Right? So for example, we have uh, declassified data on the number of accidents involving uh, nuclear weapons in the United States. Uh, and that data shows that the frequency of these accidents seems to have declined over the course of the Cold War. Right? And so maybe we can attribute that to a better safety procedures. Um, we also saw right after the Cuban Missile Crisis, a lot of steps that were taken by the superpowers to try to mitigate nuclear dangers, right? You had uh, the creation of a hotline, right, for quick communication between Washington and Moscow in crises. Um, and the 60s and 70s saw a range of arms control treaties that were intended to limit both horizontal and vertical proliferation, right? So the Limited Test Ban Treaty, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the ABM and SALT treaties, right? So that might all look like the sort of nuclear learning that we would hope would take place. Uh, but actually, in other important ways, the superpowers failed to learn the lessons that these sort of um, optimistic nuclear ar learning arguments would expect. Right? So one obvious point, the superpowers never gave up on arms racing during the Cold War. Right? They built up tens of thousands of nuclear weapons each. Right? The United States, in particular, never gave up on the idea of achieving some degree of nuclear superiority over the Soviet Union, um, invested heavily in counterforce capabilities, um, which it believed would help kind of reassure its allies that it would protect them, uh, provide a coercive edge against the Soviet Union, um, and also kind of drain the Soviet economy. Moreover, if you kind of look at some of the most dangerous miscalculations or nu nuclear near misses, if you want to think about them that way, a lot of them actually occurred towards the tail end of the Cold War, right? So uh, this incident in 1979 uh, where uh, a training tape was kind of errantly inserted into the console at NORAD, and you had this belief that a Soviet nuclear attack was incoming, right? Uh, a kind of similar incident that took place in 1983 in the Soviet Union, where it appeared uh, that an American nuclear attack was incoming, and the Soviet kind of officer uh, on watch had to figure out what to do. The Able Archer uh, exercise or crisis, depending on how you want to characterize it, in 1983, where it seems that at least some Soviet officials were considering the possibility the U.S. might be preparing to launch kind of a preemptive nuclear attack. Lots of very dangerous incidents, right, that occurred at the end of the Cold War, which suggests you don't kind of have this overall um, general trend towards uh, more safety and security over time, right? So you get, you get some learning, but it's maybe not as comprehensive as we might hope for. Uh, then we have India-Pakistan, right, which, as I said, is kind of even more... Um, disconfirming of these sort of nuclear learning uh, arguments. Right, so Pakistan first got nuclear weapons covertly in the 1980s. Um, initially, it adopted a nuclear posture, uh, which is quite consistent with maybe what a nuclear learning optimist might expect. Right? It intended to use its nuclear weapons really only as a last resort if its national survival was at stake. Um, it did not kind of posture its arsenal for quick use. Um, it stored its nuclear weapons in separate components at different locations. Uh, and uh, you also had uh, a nuclear posture that wasn't even designed for uh, directly using nuclear weapons against India. Instead, the idea um, is what Vipin Narang has described as a catalytic nuclear posture. Right? What Pakistan hoped to do was um, kind of signal to the United States if a crisis broke out with India that it was readying its nuclear arsenal, and that would convince Washington to step in and kind of defuse the crisis diplomatically, kind of obviating the need for nuclear use. That sort of more restrained posture all changed or started to change after the end of the Cold War. Um, so the Soviet Union withdraws from Afghanistan. This kind of uh, ends American patronage of Pakistan. That led them to consider kind of taking their security more fully in their own hands. Um, after India conducted a series of tests in 1998, Pakistan responded in kind with its own tests, and it moved towards a much more aggressive uh, nuclear first use strategy, uh, which threatened the use of tactical nuclear weapons on the battlefield to defeat an Indian invasion. Um, to make this strategy credible, Pakistan adopted uh, a more looser, delegative approach to controlling its arsenal. 
aiming to make sure that its nuclear weapons could be readied um, and used kind of quickly in a conflict. Um, what Arsenault and Fever in our volume uh, call a conditional command and control arrangement. Um, this, of course, raises you know, greater risks of accidents or theft as these nuclear weapons are kind of being moved around in a crisis scenario, but it was deemed essential for kind of making this first use posture credible. Um, as many of you know, one year after the nuclear tests, uh, Pakistan launched the operation that would become uh, the Cargill War. Um, there's a lot of debate among scholars about decision making here. Uh, but there's some evidence that Pakistani leaders were at least in part banking on the idea that their new nuclear capacity would kind of limit how strongly India would respond to them, right? And so many have talked about this as kind of a textbook case of nuclear emboldenment. Um, even though Pakistani uh, nuclear threats didn't actually prevent Indian forces from prevailing, uh, Pakistan did not conclude from this uh, that its nuclear arsenal or that using its nuclear arsenal as a shield for aggression was ineffective, as these nuclear learning arguments might expect. Instead, it kind of doubled down, right? It reinforced this nuclear first use posture and tried to make it more credible, right? The lesson was not that this is a dangerous posture. The lesson was we need to make sure India is even more convinced that we really would use nuclear weapons first. Um, if you look at um, Pakistani behavior over the, last, uh, the subsequent few decades, uh, they continued to support militant groups that were attacking India, including extremely provocative attacks, right, against the Indian parliament, uh, against civilian targets in Mumbai in 2008, uh, there's a lot of evidence suggesting Pakistan's nuclear weapons and its first use strategy provided its leaders with the confidence they could kind of engage in these aggressive activities while restraining India from retaliating directly. Okay, let me briefly talk about India now. Like Pakistan, you see sort of the opposite trajectory from what nuclear learning arguments uh, would expect. Uh, kind of gradually moving from a very restrained nuclear posture focused just on deterring nuclear attacks to a more aggressive posture aimed at kind of countering these aggressive um, Pakistani activities. Um, so the Indian case we think highlights one of the main weaknesses um, in these optimistic arguments about nuclear learning. Uh, basically a state may initially or at some point come to believe the right stabilizing lessons about nuclear weapons, but then they might unlearn those lessons if their adversary uh, has different beliefs about nuclear weapons uh, and takes advantage of their restrained policy. Right? And so India was kind of forced to uh, reshape its nuclear posture because Pakistan was not kind of following the dictates of these nuclear learning arguments. So initially, like Pakistan, India's posture was very much kind of restrained or recessed. Um, nuclear weapons stored in separate components. Uh, everything was kind of organized around just having the ability to retaliate for a nuclear attack against India, right? And not even necessarily having the ability to retaliate quickly, but maybe over uh, a matter of days. Um, India declared a no first use policy. Um, and if you look at, you know, Indian leadership in the late 90s or early 2000s, they seem to very much have believed that the introduction of nuclear weapons in South Asia would stabilize their relationship, right, and prevent the emergence of major conflict, um, like these nuclear learning arguments would hope for, or like these arguments about uh, the nuclear revolution would expect. Uh, then Indian leaders very quickly face the Cargill War, right, which I already mentioned, and this very bold terrorist attack on the Indian parliament. This starts the process of the Indian government unlearning these stabilizing lessons. Uh, they conclude that Pakistan is using its nuclear weapons uh, to backstop this aggressive policy, and they need to find a way to kind of neutralize uh, Pakistan's efforts. There are a lot of different efforts that went into this, so India starts working on a doctrine for limited conventional war under the nuclear shadow. They start uh, thinking about revisions to Indian nuclear doctrine, uh, which would allow, for example, using nuclear weapons um, in response to an attack on uh, Indian forces outside Indian territory, right? In other words, potentially on Pakistani territory. Um, from India's perspective, this was a way of convincing Pakistan its first use threats maybe weren't credible. They would face retaliation in kind, right? But from Pakistan's perspective, this might look like a strategy for supporting kind of a major, a major Indian incursion into Pakistan. Uh, these trends have all kind of continued in subsequent years. Um, there's research by uh, Chris Clary and Vipin Narang that has shown India is very much kind of moving towards um, a counterforce uh, capability against Pakistan, which at least in theory might involve, um, even though they've not stated this, um, first use against Pakistan in a crisis scenario to disarm their capacity to kind of carry out uh, their strategy of using nuclear weapons on the battlefield, right? This is all intended to create a more effective deterrent against Pakistan, but it obviously entails serious risks, uh, giving Pakistan stronger incentives to strike first in a crisis and maybe increasing pressures for arms racing. Um, meanwhile, India has demonstrated a greater tolerance for escalation with Pakistan in the conventional realm. 
um, conducting a strike in Pakistani admin administered Kaj Kashmir in 2016, launching airstrikes against Pakistani territory proper in 2019 uh, as part of the crisis that Heather mentioned. Neither of these conflicts ended up escalating further, right? But one could imagine they might have if things had gone a little bit differently. You know, for instance, uh, if Pakistani or Indian pilots were killed by enemy fire in these dogfights that took place in 2019. Um, so to kind of sum up, um, to the extent India seems to be learning lessons from these crises, it's that it can and probably should take the initiative in crises, that escalation can be controlled, right? And that risk taking can help it to kind of achieve its political goals despite the associated risks of nuclear use. Um, I'll wrap up just by saying uh, a couple things about uh, Russia's war in Ukraine and what that might tell us about this concept of nuclear learning. Um, Scott's gonna touch much more on that in his remarks. Um, it seems quite plausible to me to argue that Russia learned from uh, it, the annexation of Crimea and incursion into Eastern Ukraine in 2014, that it could take territory from Ukraine and that its nuclear arsenal meant outside powers like the United States or NATO were not gonna intervene against them, right? And Russia attempted this on a much larger scale, of course, in 2022. This conflict's still ongoing, obviously. And while it has not been nearly as successful as it anticipated clearly, um, Putin's gamble that he could deter NATO intervention by threatening nuclear use seems to have been accurate, right, at least so far. Uh, and so one could make the case that, you know, like Pakistan, uh, we do have a nuclear power that's learning lessons here, right, but they're not the stabilizing ones that we might hope for, right? Instead, it's a destabilizing lesson that you can use nuclear weapons to um, help facilitate conquest. Um, so on that uh, rather depressing note, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Scott for Q&A. Well, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, I very much appreciate uh, all three of our speakers today, both summarizing uh, the findings that they uh, have in their chapter, but also then updating uh, their concepts for the world that we're facing right now. Um, it's time for questions from the audience here and online. The online questions will be passed to me, so type them in into the Q&A function. And for people here, raise your hand, identify yourself, tell us your name and your affiliation, and then ask one question out of respect for the other people who have their questions uh, in, in the queue as well. If you have a second question and there's time, we will come back to it. So let's take the first question here in the back there, and then Doug Shaw, you'll be second. Hi, Kylie McCormick, Harvard. Um, Dr. Williams, you discussed that certain platforms such as WhatsApp versus Twitter facilitate the proliferation of disinformation differently because Twitter is this open environment in which people can pitch in. WhatsApp is going to be more closed. Is there any policy or strategy that you think tech companies can take, um, particularly in light of a big shift we're seeing in the tech industry at the moment, that would improve uh, the ability to dispel this disinformation. Telegram is also a great example of a platform that really allows this information to proliferate. So do you have any ideas along those lines? Sure. Um, great, great first question. Um, thanks. Um, I have ideas. I wouldn't say that they're necessarily recommendations because they're all pretty problematic, right? Um, but it was... Uh, I don't think it was quite a year ago that there was that um, the um, Facebook whistleblower, right, Francis Haugen, um, and came out and taught and really revealing information about how not just Facebook but all the tech companies allegedly handle disinformation. Where I, I believe Facebook claimed that they um, that they cut 90% of the fake messages, and she said no, it was actually more like 5%. So um, that I think should be a start. That really should have been a wake up call for the tech companies, but also for government regulators to say, maybe we can't always trust what the tech companies are telling us about their own self-regulation and exploring how to do that. There are a lot of problems with that, um, both in terms of you know, freedom of speech issues, but also the role of government in regulating those tech industries. So, but you asked for ideas. So that's an idea um, that I, I, would, um, I would put out there. And obviously with Elon Musk taking over Twitter, I feel like that debate is a really live and active one. Um, but so one would be for governments to get more involved in forcing the tech companies to, um, to self-regulate. The other would be if the tech companies just took it upon themselves and built up better um, systems internally to do that self-regulation. Um, 
again, that's just an idea, not a recommendation, because I can also see a real problem with that, which is do you really want to be known as the social media platform? You know, like as a social media user, am I going to go to the platform that might take down something that I post, which I think is pretty innocuous, but they say, oh, it could lead to this. That doesn't really align with tech companies' priorities, which are often to make money. Um, the other thing that I, I would actually suggest as a recommendation is um, I think it would be, I mean, I work at a think tank now, so I have to think about fundraising. I think it'd be great if tech companies invested a little more into research about how their platforms are used and, um, in being, and do that in, to get an objective perspective, to, um, but not just how they're used in terms of um, domestic politics, but also in these international situations and crises. And I know a few of the platforms have done that. I'm, um, if I'm remembering correctly, the, um, uh, in Myanmar, a lot of the um, attacks on the Rohingya there were provoked on social media. Like That's one case study where I think we might be able to say social media definitely had an inflammatory and escalatory effect. And I know that that was a wake-up call for some of the social media companies to look into how they're being used. But I think that um, for those companies, you know, it, invest in studies to figure out what, when a tweet goes out, what does it mean in an actual crisis? What does it mean in a crisis between nuclear actors? Um, and so those are things that I think government can maybe do, the tech companies can do, and in terms of investing in the research. But like I said, there's no easy answers on that one. Those are just ideas, not necessarily hard and fast recommendations. But great question, thank you. Thank you. Look a shot right here. Thanks. I wanna make sure the new Pony crew gets their chance to ask questions. So please, formulate a good one. Doug Shaw with GW, thank you so much to each of you for this very exciting project and your work on it. Uh, and, and Scott, for your reflection on uh, the role of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences historically in producing knowledge about nuclear deterrence and restraint. Um, I am wondering what you think about the state of knowledge production. Admiral Richard uh, complained quite a bit that uh, we need to recapitalize the, uh, the intellectual capacity for nuclear deterrence work in the United States over the last few years. Uh, and I am concerned that we don't have the kinds of dramatic progress like that uh, 1960 uh, uh, Daedalus issue suggests. I'm wondering uh, what the, uh, the authors think about the state of the field and how to kick it into a higher gear of progression. Thank you. Well, I, I can start. I, I'm deeply concerned. Um, I'm saying this here in front of new group of pony uh, people. I think that's a, a, an exception and one that I hope will continue. But if you look at the position academically, from a university perspective, um, uh, I'm sure you'll see this at, at, at GW, um, the foundations that have traditionally supported um, research and the training of postdoctoral fellows in nuclear security are diminishing. The Hewlett Foundation got out of the business about six years ago. The MacArthur Foundation, for reasons that I believe have more to do with the difficulty of measuring success in this area compared to other areas got out of the business and has decided that they're no longer going to support research and training in, in nuclear security. It leaves the Stanton Foundation and the Carnegie Corporation of New York as the two largest ones. The Stanton Foundation plans to um, eventually sunset out uh, and give away their, their money, but they have a variety of other things other than nuclear security. They're very interested in the protection of dogs, uh, and they're very interested in, um, in the use of history uh, in what, what Graham Allison calls applied history. And it's not clear how much of their future funding, even when they go into a sunset clause, uh, will be given to um, nuclear security education. So I think um, Pony's doing very important work, uh, and we simply need to get private donors perhaps in the effective altruism movement or elsewhere, to decide that it's their time to step up uh, to the plate and really help out this very important area. But it, it remains to be seen whether that will be successful. Comments from others? I, I could get a somewhat more optimistic take, I guess. Um, I mean, I started graduate school in, was it 2009? 
I mean, a lot has changed in the last 20 years, I think, in terms of the level of interest in studying nuclear deterrence and nuclear weapons within academia and in a positive way, right? So after the end of the Cold War, people in large part stopped studying nuclear weapons, right? And everyone started focusing on civil wars. And after 9-11, everyone was interested in terrorism and counterterrorism. Um, but since, I would say, yeah, around 2010 or so, that trend has started to reverse, right? And there are a lot more people that are studying nuclear proliferation, nuclear deterrence, in part because some of these foundations like Stanton are providing resources to attract people into those areas. So I think that in terms of like the amount of intellectual horsepower that's put into these questions in academia, it's actually in a better position now than it was 10 or 20 years ago. Um, and I mean, if you just look at some of the people that have been going into government, you know, in the Biden administration from academia, people like you know, the co-editor of this volume, uh, Vipin, um, that also I think is, um, it's occurring at a higher scale than it typically does, right? And so you have like more academics that are working on this area and they seem to be having like more influence on policy, I would say, than also you saw like 10 or 20 years ago. Um, that doesn't, um, you know, discount any of the challenges that Scott identified and certainly in the funding space, things are looking relatively bleak, um, but it's not, it's not all bad, I would say. Just I would, oh, sorry, go ahead. Really quickly, I mean, um, just for you know anybody in the room interested in doing sort of policy impactful work, I think they're you know Admiral Richards not the only one. I think with those kinds of thoughts, uh, I mean here here in D.C. meetings on the Hill, questions about asymmetric arms control, tri trilateral arms control, the effects of multipolarity on U.S. national security interests, the future of the U.S. nuclear force posture after New Start, those kinds of debates. I mean, there's a lot of really relevant. Um, I think intellectual work to be done to sort of support these debates that are going to be happening here in DC and around the country. And I'm just talking about the United States. I mean, I think in other parts of the world, uh, there, are, you know, there are an equally important number of issues to be handled. I mean, just in Northeast Asia, where I spend a lot of time, I think there's a significant rethink of what exactly nuclear weapons mean for peace and security uh, in that part of the world as well. So I think uh, for anybody looking to get into the field, uh, all of these practical considerations on funding, Aside, I mean, there's a lot of really exciting intellectual work to be done that really will fill some important gaps. And I think one of the things I really like about this volume is that it recognizes that not all of the problems are fundamentally new. Survivability, deterrence, command and control problems we've been talking about for 70 plus years. And the problems, the nature of those problems have changed, but the fundamentals um, largely remain the same. Uh, and so that, that sort of combination of old and new, I think, is something that this volume does really well. And I hope that a lot of people that will continue to do work in this area will recognize. Heather. Very quick observation. I think you're hitting on something that's even bigger than what, we, what we've acknowledged, which is there's I, that nuclear weapons left public consciousness for a very long time. And I think a lot of people uh, in this country and everywhere really almost forgot about them. Uh, and recent events have forced them back into public, public consciousness. And there's a little bit of a reckoning going on, which is remembering, oh, there are still you know, thousands of these out there and any one of them could cause um, you know, fundamental geopolitical shifts, not to mention potentially humanitarian you know, massive consequences. And so I, I think that part of the challenge is um, it's not just the analysis of these things, it's not just getting it funded, it is also how do we do that in a way that does bring them into the public consciousness, but in a responsible way that isn't just pure fear mongering, um, that in, can engage with the public. And this is where I think that the academic scholarship is incredibly important because it's gonna be deep, it's going to be meaningful and robust and thoughtful. I think it's equally important that we figure out how to translate that to a much wider and bigger audience. Um, this is something where I actually really wanna give a lot of credit to Anka in particular because you know, your background is as a journalist, you know how to write to reach people, you know how to write in a way that will, might reach a much wider audience than um, sometimes happens in academia. And so I think having people that are writing in you know, trade press books, um, TV series, quite frankly, th those efforts I think are just as important as the scholarship that has to back them up. You know, we can't just be out there um, promoting hot takes. It has to be really good research, which is where the academy really comes in and plays an important role. But how the message is communicated is important to raise that public consciousness about nuclear weapons again, I think. I agree very much with that last comment, Heather, and um, much of my recent research with Ben Valentino and with Yanina Dill um, has shown how hawkish the American publics and other publics are when it comes to nuclear weapons use. Uh, 
to give one example um, uh, that the majority of the public, uh, American public, would be willing to use nuclear weapons in a conflict in Iran if it would save American soldiers' lives. And in a survey about North Korea, we found that um, when you told one segment of the group that North Korea had just developed a nuclear capability to hit the United States, and another group said that they didn't yet have it, the group that received the information saying that North Korea could now hit the United States was more likely to support a preventive attack than the other group. And that was surprising, and we think that that was because the public fe fe felt that North Korea in developing that capability was because they were intent to use it, and that they didn't think about deterrence as a, as a potential motive on the behalf of, of the North Koreans. Now, there have been some scholars who have criticized my work in this area by saying that once you tell the public that the public supports nuclear wars, it's, go, it's going to make it more likely because people will follow what, what, what the majority says. My view is exactly the opposite. We need to identify these problems and then work really hard in the ways that you're suggesting to use our scholarship to educate a wider public. And that's why whenever I publish an academic piece, I try very hard to also publish something in the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post or the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists or Foreign Affairs that gets a much wider audience to read it as part of that public education efforts. Yeah. Question in the back row with the uh, thank you. My name is Samanve. I am a student at Georgetown and also one of the nuclear scholars here today. Uh, my question is to Dr. Miller about nuclear learning and responsible nuclear behavior. Um, how do you think you would incentivize a state that sees actual tangible positive benefits from dangerous and destabilizing nuclear behavior, whether it's dual-use weapons and entanglement, or alerted weapons, or forward-deployed weapons, et cetera. Like, w how do you think one would incentivize these states? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very difficult question. Um, you know, if you think about the, the sort of obstacles we identify to, you know, this optimistic sort of nuclear learning argument taking place, um, that maybe identifies some avenues for states to kind of, you know, learn the so-called right lessons, right? So, you know, secrecy is one obstacle we identify to this nuclear learning taking place. And so to the extent that, you know, publics try to make nuclear weapons policy, you know, an issue of public debate, right, and bring this out into the open more, um, that's one potential avenue. And of course, that is difficult, and it depends on the regime type of the country, right? And it's not something you can really do in an authoritarian state. Um, another uh, factor we identify is the influence of uh, militaries, right? And so to the extent that, you know, countries can exert greater civilian control over their nuclear arsenals, there's a lot of reason to think that that's probably going to push in the direction of these, you know, more safe, uh, responsible nuclear policies. Um, I mentioned in my remarks, right, it's one of the difficulties um, in nuclear learning taking place is uh, people can learn a lot of different lessons from a conflict or a crisis, right? Um, but I would say that, you know, even though there is that subjectivity, right, there are probably, like, limits to the subjectivity, right? And if you can try to show to a nuclear power that um, this sort of aggressive policy that they pursued backfired in sort of an obvious and catastrophic way, that's probably going to have some impact, right? And so I think that's really relevant to what's going on in Ukraine right now, right? And that's very much in the discourse about what U.S. policy should be in terms of supporting Ukraine, right? And a lot of people are saying it's really important for... Russia to be defeated in like a pretty decisive way, right? So that Putin learns the lesson that actually no, your nuclear threats are not gonna allow you to go gobble up Ukraine, right? And so I think if there's kind of a very ambiguous outcome to the, the war, right? And you know, Russia succeeds at keeping a significant portion of territory, but not everything it wanted. That's the sort of ambiguity, right? That could lead people to infer different lessons, right? And Putin might come away from it saying, hey, it actually, you know, it worked not as well as I thought it did, and let me take another bite at the apple down the road, right? On the other hand, a more decisive defeat for Putin, I think it would be harder for him to spin that sort of story, right? And maybe they would rethink how nuclear weapons affect their foreign policy, right? Of course, there's a lot of risks associated with that, right? We're talking about nuclear weapons. Um, we still have to take into account the possibility that, you know, 
the prospect of a really decisive defeat would actually lead Putin to use nuclear weapons. Um, but I think that's, that's um, an example of you know, a case where it's uh, important to you know, try to drive home the lesson, uh, drive home a clear lesson right, about um, nuclear weapons not being really effective um, tools for um, uh, facilitating conquest. Um, my name's Lisa, I'm one of the Pony Scholars. Um, my question's for Heather. Um, I'm wondering, in regards to the 2018 and the 2017 crises that you mentioned, was there any evidence that adversaries respond to these uh, social media alerts, and uh, could, uh, could they be perceived as real by an adversary? Great question. Um, in the 2017 and 2018 crises, I'm not remembering anything. However, the, there's another case that I'm thinking of that was not in, um, that was not in this volume, but that um, I'd researched separately, and that was uh, the killing of Soleimani in um, uh, January 2020. Dates are just like weird, uh, <laughs> it's just like a vacuum. But anyways, uh, in, yeah, in January 2020, where um, that was a really fascinating case on social media as well, because you saw this back and forth between Trump and a variety of Iranian officials. And so that was one where, um, from the US perspective, the Iran, the adversary, absolutely did respond, right? So one of the most famous tweets that Trump had sent was when he threatened to destroy, I believe, uh, 54 uh, Iranian, uh, I might be getting the number wrong, but um, a number of Iranian cultural heritage sites. The and same number of sites as, as hostages it is. that were taken during the Iran hostage. Yeah. Right. Uh, and. Iran absolutely responded to that. Zarif got on Twitter. Mind you, Twitter is not, is not um, allowed in Iran, so this was clearly for a Western audience. And Zarif said, you have literally just threatened to commit a war crime. Um, and a variety of other Iranian officials got involved. And so I think whether or not an adversary responds depends on the nature of the message. If um, a, a leader really bungles the message and gets it wrong, the adversary is probably going to call it out and try and take advantage of it. Depends on if the adversary uses social media, what platform they use. Um, Zarif is a very is um, a, an avid tweeter. Um, I actually think he's pretty effective in, in how he uses it in trying to shape the narrative. Um, but in the cases that we looked at, it, it really, there wasn't, to those crises, there wasn't much of a response. In the, in the Pakistan case, you know, most of the social media activity I talked about was on the Indian side because there just isn't as much social media activity on the Pakistani side. Excellent. Right here. Hi, my name is Ashley Christ. I'm a, a nuclear scholar here with uh, Pony today. Uh, my question is for Dr. Miller. Are there any particular lessons that you see evidence China has learn, been learning from the US and Russia regarding arms control since they don't have their own experience with arms control like the US and Russia have? That's a good question. I'd be interested in everyone else's thoughts on the panel. Um, I mean, I think the the, the basic uh, dynamic here is one of like such asymmetry, right? In terms of the size of the arsenals between you know the United States and Russia on one side and China on the other, that arms control is still kind of like a relatively you know far off distant prospect. Um, and I mean, if you look at kind of the state of U.S. Russia arms control, um, it's not looking particularly good. You know, the last few years either. I mean, you did get the extension of New Start, but it's not clear what's going to happen after. We reach the end point of that. You have the decline of um, the demise of the INF Treaty, um, and so I mean I think China is probably looking around and saying this is like not a particularly conducive environment for arms control. I mean if you look at kind of like the broader sweep of history, um, you know you tend to get more progress on arms control during periods of political detente, right? When tensions are somewhat lower, and obviously we're kind of in the exact opposite environment right now. In terms of the United States and China, also the United States and Russia, um, and so I mean, I think the you know the prospects for arms control in the near term are unfortunately pretty bleak, right? And it's kind of hard to think about how or what like a trilateral arms control arrangement um, between the United States, Russia, and China would look like, right? Given the disparity in arsenal size, I mean, China's trying to close that gap, obviously, um, and I don't really see kind of what the the Chinese incentive would be at this point. Right when they're kind of trying to, um, you know, establish themselves as you know a power on par with the United States. 
I'm curious to hear other people's thoughts on that too. Yeah, just, okay. just very quickly, I think um, in the, in the post-Cuban Missile Crisis, U.S., Soviet, and U.S., Russian context, I think arms control has been traditionally understood to solve the problem or at least lower the probability of unwanted war and reduce the costs of peacetime competition and the consequences of nuclear war should deterrence fail. Uh, in the Chinese context, I mean, especially reading Chinese military thought and through authoritative texts, uh, textbooks for the PLA, the idea of unwanted war uh, is not a prominent theme more generally, that all wars, in essence, are wanted. And so questions of inadvertent escalation, miscalculation, misperception are, I think, generally seen as less prominent in a strategic relationship between two countries. Um, China, however, understands that the United States cares about this quite a bit. So when former Speaker Pelosi visited Taipei last year, the first types of dialogues for China to withhold from the United States were certain forms of maritime and other crisis management talks between the militaries. The other thing on arms control in China, and this sort of relates to nuclear learning, or at least internally, is the historiography within China of the reasons for Soviet collapse has actually changed quite a bit since the 1990s and under Xi Jinping. And we saw a little bit of this after Michael, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev passed away. The obituaries in, in Chinese state media uh, emphasized the reasons for Soviet collapse as primarily being Gorbachev's uh, infidelity to the ideological project of the Soviet Union. Whereas in the 1990s, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the historical tale that the Communist Party of China would tell itself about the causes for Soviet collapse were partly quite consistent with what we told ourselves in the West, was that the arms race was an important contributor to Soviet ruin uh, in, uh, in the 1980s leading up to collapse. And so that's an interesting shift that I think, again, contributes to perhaps how China might be viewing the possibility of now, um, in some ways at least, arms racing with the United States, which for decades uh, China had said it would never do because arms racing would only lead to, to ruin and, and was a bridge to nowhere. Uh, so so uh, those two dynamics, I think, strike me as quite relevant to how um, nuclear learning in China on arms control might be playing out. I, I agree with all of that. I have two additional. There are two lessons that I hope China and others would learn from uh, from U.S. Soviet and U.S. Russia arms control. The first is that arms control is what great powers do. And if you want to be a great power, you should, you know, at some point engage with another great power on arms control. It's an opportunity to, if not show off, to hint at parity. Um, and so for China, if, you know, China definitely wants, is on the track to being a great power or wants to be or already is a great power, um, try to sell the prestige of arms control. The one other lesson learned that I hope they would take is that you can actually get out of arms control what's something that you want. If you want limits on U.S. regional missile defenses, arms control might be a vehicle for getting there. You're going to have to give up something in the process. But if you want to save money, arms control is an option for that. So seeing arms control not as something that it necessarily is like a unilateral giving something away, arms control is also something where you can gain something. Like our missile defense, I think, is the most obvious option for... Um, as what China and Russia really want to get from the U.S. If they are willing to give up, you know, this was a discussion before the invasion of Ukraine, it, it, would there be a deal to be had in which Russia gives up some tactical nuclear weapons for politically binding limits on U.S. missile defenses? Yeah, that option isn't happening now. But something like that could be, and so just to show arms control isn't a gift that you give, you also achieve something with it. Question right next here. And if there are any questions from the online audience, Hi, Matthew Gensel, Longview Philanthropy. I'm also with the New Nuclear Scholars Initiative. Um, I have a two-part question for Heather. Uh, the first part of this is, were there any cases in your social media studies where open platforms were worse than private platforms? In my own uh, research prior to Longview, I found that there's an incentive uh, to moderate proactive disinformation, but there's also an incentive to not share um, accurate but unpopular views when you're in a more open environment as opposed to a more closed environment. Yeah. Then the second question here is, in terms of regulation, are there other kinds of institutions that you see that could be helpful for social media? It would seem like private tech companies are in a situation where their interests aren't perfectly aligned with the public, whereas the government, even if it's a democracy, things that shape how people can speak and engage in public, it's, there could be huge um, power concentration issues there. And I'll leave it at that. Your second question is a really fascinating one. So, is there kind of a third party role that could, that, a third party that could play some sort of like a mediator or regulatory role in here? I think that we're already seeing that with not social media, but more traditional media companies. So, um, I remember the Washington Post had a daily, 
um, they would every single day they would post. Uh, it was about the, the former president, but uh, the the principle behind it, I think, was was a sound one, which was here are lies that or here are um, not things that the president said that are not true. Um, I think some other traditional media companies, I'm pretty sure the New York Times also does try to regulate disinformation. And if there's a huge piece of disinformation going around on social media, then traditional media companies are showing, I think, a responsibility or feel and are showing a responsibility to call that out. But I actually want to go in and think about if there could be some sort of like, I, I don't know, like an independent commission moderating that sort of thing. I, I would love to hear what you think about that. In terms of cases in which there was worse um, open social media, it was worse than closed. Um, to be honest, it was usually, they're both, they were both usually pretty bad. Um, a lot of the times closed social media would start with sharing a story that was seen on open social media, right? So if you have a WhatsApp group, it starts with, oh, I saw this on Twitter. And then it just kind of becomes the spark within that echo chamber that gets it going. Um, and just, you know, just sharing, it is that kind of disinformation ecosystem where one story just gets shared around and around and around. And so, you know, we, what we found was those open platforms, there might be more opportunities for self-regulation, but I also hear your point that people might be more um, um, self-censoring in what they put on there. But I, I do think that they're both um, a bit more intertwined than I probably put forth in, in my remarks. So I really appreciate your contribution on that. It's a really good point. One last question from the online audience from Namza at the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies for Ankit. What are South Korean public, public opinion perspectives on deterrence in the acquisition of nuclear weapons for South Korea? Yeah, well, I guess we didn't get off this panel without talking about South Korea, which has been in the headlines <laughs> recently, uh, which may one day be a new nuclear state. Let's hope not. Um, but uh, that's, a, that's a terrific question. Um, here I'll have to cite uh, research done by uh, my Carnegie colleague Toby Dalton, uh, Carl Friedhoff at the Chicago Council, and Lamy Kim. Uh, they carried out a survey exercise last year, uh, which for the first time actually asked some subsidiary questions to the South Korean public about nuclear weapons acquisition and looked at sort of beliefs on what nuclear weapons do and don't do and why various parts of the South Korean public want nuclear weapons. Their top line finding was that about 71% of the South Korean public uh, sees nuclear weapons in some form as beneficial for South Korean security. In some form, of course, being the possibility of American tactical nuclear weapons redeployment to South Korea, where those weapons departed in December 1991. There is now a debate about the possibility of their return or the possibility of South Korea independently acquiring nuclear weapons. I think one of the most interesting findings in that study, uh, intuitively we might think that um, views in South Korea on at least acquiring their own nuclear weapons are probably negatively correlated with uh, faith in the United States, uh, the, the guarantor of South Korean security through our extended deterrent. Uh, but instead, uh, there was no search, uh, you know, no such correlation. In fact, uh, in, in many ways, South Koreans who were quite enthusiastic about the United States and extended deterrence similarly saw nuclear weapons as having benefits for their own security, likely due to the United States perhaps conveying to some of our allies inadvertently that nuclear weapons hold great salience in our own national defense, and therefore why, if nuclear weapons are good for us, why can't they be good for South Korea? Um, I, will, I will just uh, you know, say this, I know we're short on time. Um, I think fundamentally, the interest in nuclear weapons acquisition boils down to a belief, uh, both among the public and among even policy elites within this administration in Seoul, that only nuclear weapons deter other nuclear weapons. And to tie this back to the fragile balance of terror, I think one of the benefits of the volume like this, the chapters on nuclear learning and others, uh, is to look at other cases, like uh, India and Pakistan is a good one that I talk about a lot in Seoul, sort of looking at the problems nuclear weapons did and did not solve for India with a neighbor like Pakistan that has a policy of first use is willing to accept more risk. Uh, and fundamentally, nuclear weapons do not deter all types of behaviors that one might find objectionable from one's adversary. And South Korea tends to find many North Korean behaviors objectionable and would ideally like to live with none of those behaviors. Um, the answer to that problem uh, maybe cannot be solved by conventional or nuclear tools alone. And so this is a problem that has to be managed, uh, but that is the fundamental, I think, of, uh, of why we're starting to see these debates in Seoul become more prominent. Uh, and you know, we did see some headlines this month, of course. I don't think that's the last we'll hear of South Korean interest in nuclear weapons acquisition. Well, before we move to the next part of the program, please join me in thanking our three speakers for their excellent talks today.
the next part of the program uh, is going to be our keynote address um, by Scott. Um, you've been hearing from him. I'm going to briefly give you a little bit more on um, his background and bio. Scott Sagan is the Carolyn S.G. Monroe Professor of Political Science, the M uh, Mimi and Peter Haas University Fellow in Undergraduate Education, and Senior Fellow at the Center for International Security and Cooperation in the Freeman Spogli Institute at Stanford University. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and serves as chair of the Academy's Committee on International Security Studies. And if he will forgive me for briefly editorializing a piece of his bio, he is also the recent recipient of the uh, Therese Del Pesce Award uh, bestowed by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace for exceptional leadership and mentorship in the nuclear field. And you've probably picked up on it that Scott has been a mentor to so many of us, to probably every person who wrote in this volume at some point, Scott has just been an incredible source of support. And so it truly is a huge honor um, to introduce our keynote presenter, Scott Sagan. Well, thank you for that very warm introduction. I'll put this here. Um, if I could have the slides up. Oh, good. Um, one of the um, most interesting chapters in the book, a book that's filled with interesting, insightful chapters, um, is a chapter by Rose McDermott saying, what difference do personalist dictators with nuclear weapons make for international security? What's different about the regime uh, led by an individual um, who may make rash decisions, who surrounds himself, and it usually is him, uh, with yes men, and it usually is yes men, uh, and who think that perhaps only they can make the brave decisions that cause, uh, will cause an adversary to back down and rewrite the future of history. We often think in deterrence that um, deterrence requires rational actors, but what if Somebody is rational but has really bad information because they surrounded themselves with yes men. What if they make rash decisions, not totally unrelated to cost benefit analysis, but rash, imprudent decisions, and there's no one to push back against them? Rose's chapter focuses primarily on Kim Jong un. Secondarily, with Saddam Hussein and the decision-making processes that a potential nuclear ac uh, acquisition state uh, had. And only lightly, but importantly, on a wannabe personalist dictator, Donald Trump. He's the elephant in the chapter um, because he made rash decisions uh, and often got pushback or slow running um, from senior officials, military and civilian. In this sense, deterrence might not require a rational actor, but may require checks and balances on an irrational actor. I thought what I would do today is um, talk about the role of nuclear weapons in the war in Ukraine. Nick has already mentioned this, as did Heather uh, and Ankit, but I want to say a little bit more and try to um, outline why I think we have not been thinking about this properly. I've often asked, is Putin bluffing in these statements that he has made? And my answer is that bluffing is what people do when they have already decided they don't have the capability to do something and they're trying to scare somebody into thinking they have a capability. What he's doing is not bluffing. What he's doing is trying to scare people, trying to create disunity, but he's also trying out ideas because he doesn't know. He knows he has the capabilities to use nuclear weapons, but he hasn't figured out how other people would react yet and what the potential situation would be. And therefore, I believe very strongly that there have been some premature declarations of success. We've deterred Putin from using nuclear weapons. And I think just as the war is going to be really hard and difficult this spring and next summer, uh, 
I think the nuclear threats are going to remain and may increase, and we need to therefore think about what kinds of nuclear threats, what kinds of nuclear uses, how best to deter them, and how best to respond if necessary. Well, I just wanted to start just reminding you of this photograph when Putin is announcing the nuclear alert, which turned out not to be operational, very meaningful, but, say, but doing this with the, Secret, with the Minister of Defense and the Chief of the General Staff at the opposite end of this long room is emblematic, I think, of this problem of isolated decision making. Compare this to the XCOM, where everyone's sitting around arguing with each other and where the president sometimes leaves the room to say, I don't want to tip people's hand by me being there. I want you guys to thrash this out and then present the different options to me. This is really a, a, a very good illustration of personalized decision making. Let's walk through the different threats that have been made. Here you have one from 2018 in which Putin talks about Russians going to heaven and others going, uh, not being able to even have a chance to repent. This is prior to any decision of invasion of Ukraine, but it is something to try to reassure Russians about the consequences of nuclear war not being as bad. We talked earlier about the education of the public in nuclear learning. This is a very different kind of nuclear learning in, in efforts to talk to a more religious public, and a public that if you read Adam, Adam, Adam Dempsey's book, you'll see that actually some of the religious uh, leaders of Russia have bought into these kinds of, of, of calculations. Very disturbing. In February, he is clearly trying to deter U.S. and NATO intervention in the war in Ukraine. And it partly worked. It worked with respect to um, President Biden immediately saying that we're not going to enter into World War III and making the decision, I think the right one, but perhaps it shouldn't have been made quite so publicly and quite so quickly to, have a, to, get rid, to not enforce a no-fly zone. But then only gradually you see how this threat did not work in terms of deterring other forms of intervention. And what you've seen is a constant increase in what NATO and uh, the U.S. in particular uh, has been giving to Ukraine with really important effects. The next round of threats come during annexation, when Putin threatens that if the territorial integrity is threatened, we have nuclear weapons, and our doctrine is to potentially use them, but he is now including new annexed territory for the first time. Now, that threat did not work because Ukraine clearly was already engaging in fighting some of the, that, that territory and has continued both operations, including operations against Crimea, uh, against the Donbass, and against um, uh, some uh, operations against Russia itself. But here I wanted to note something that was disturbing about this. It was for the first time he was not talking about general responses. He's citing the United States bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945 and saying there's a precedent. This is an indirect threat, not of tactical battlefield use, but of strategic uses against Ukrainian cities. I don't know what was said to um, with the Director Burns or Secretary Austin um, or Secretary Blinken said to their counterparts uh, afterwards, but I hope they 
said something to the effect of, yes, you're right. We used nuclear weapons to end a war in Japan in 1945, but Japan could not strike back. Ukraine can strike back. And we, in my imagined uh, conversations with Russian leaders, I hope our leaders said, and we will ensure that Ukraine can strike back effectively. I think it's appropriate that the administration has not created a commitment trap by saying exactly how it would react, because then you get stuck by having to do what it is that you had thought about. But I do know that the administration has been thinking through these uh, actions, and it depends a lot on what kinds of nuclear use might be used. This is the worst one, and I think would deserve the most strongest uh, of responses. The most recent comment was actually moving in the opposite. To be, Putin can spin things remarkably uh, at home and, and abroad. And here he's claiming that I wasn't really nuclear threats. I was just responding to the threats that, that NATO uh, uh, was making. Um, And he's trying to deny this. And then there is this. I don't know whether we'll be able to get the actual video. This is where Putin um, is asked about that earlier 2018 comment where he said that Russians will go to heaven. And his interviewer says, well, I hope you're not talking about it anytime soon. And this is how Putin responds. Oh, no, it doesn't work. Well, I'll describe the video. You see him smirking here. He, he's asked that, and he just stares at the interviewer. He doesn't answer. And after a very long, awkward silence, the interviewer says, now you're scaring me. And Putin smiles and said, yes, I'm scaring you. Mission accomplished. To my mind, that shows that he knows that he's trying to scare people. And he knows that in this case it has an effect, but it's a metaphor for a wider thing that he's trying to do. And so I think that the research in political science shows that states and leaders often, not always, gamble for resurrection when they are facing extreme losses. If a state feels that it's about to lose a war, some leaders, often leaders that feel that they are going to be overthrown, not just by losing office, but by losing their lives, feel that they are going to take extraordinary risk. And that's the kind of risks we're going to, to face. So I was just going to point out that as we think about this, I think that it is um, important to actually think more operationally, to think about what kinds of nuclear uses might Putin order, how can we best deter it, and how might we want to respond? Well, first, many people have said, well, what if there is a demonstration strike at some unpopulated area? I think that is the least likely nuclear use. Demonstration strikes might make sense if a country is trying to demonstrate it has a capability. We all know Russia has a capability. A demonstration strike that kills no one and has no military effectiveness would not, in my judgment, signal resolve. It would signal irresolution and lack of a serious intent to escalate, because that's what you're trying to do when you're signaling resolve. And I think Putin is the kind of leader who is very sensitive to appearances of 
loss of resolve. The second is the battlefield use on a Ukrainian military target. And here, I would say I was quite worried during the seizure of Mariupol because all those soldiers in a underground industrial facility causing large number of Russian military casualties to take them out are a very good nuclear target. I think the Ukrainians are learning a lesson, and I hope they continue to learn it, which is to not give such targets. So their military operations are designed in part not to have large-scale units in a single defensive position that could pose an attractive uh, target for a low-yield nuclear weapon. And that leads me, unfortunately, to think that one of the major options would be multiple battlefield uses. If you're going to break the nuclear taboo or nuclear tradition of non-use, why do it in a single weapon that's ineffective? If you're going to take that action, you would want to do it in a way that would be more decisive, would take out lots of Ukrainian forces. We know from the Gulf War that when the United States when Caspar Weinberger asked Colin Powell to study nuclear weapons use, if Saddam used chemical weapons, he came back saying it's going to take a lot of nuclear weapons against the armor of, of the Iraqi army and, and Republican Guard. And then the last is what he hinted at with the comment about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So how do you deter someone like Vladimir Putin? Well, first, I think we've done some good things. I think we should credit U.S. diplomacy in part with the comments that she and uh, Modi made earlier that a nuclear war cannot be won, should never be fought, and doing this in the middle of this war with Ukraine. But I think that the other thing that we can do is in our conversations and discussions with other Russians, we can try to increase the likelihood that they know that their leader has made a disastrous decision. And the disastrous decision to start this costly war in Ukraine would be magnified if he uses nuclear weapons. Unfortunately, the second, actually the first and second and the third uses of nuclear weapons here might not be illegal because of the way uh, the Geneva Conventions permit uses of any weapon against a military target if it's uh, Collateral damage is not disproportionate to the military benefits. But it would be strategically really harmful for Russia. It would be lawful but awful. And we should be reminding the Russians that that's the case. And on the last one, I think we should be reminding the Russians, the Russian military leadership, that any attack on a Ukrainian city with a nuclear weapon would be illegal. It would be a war crime. And the United States and Western countries have a long history of dealing not just with leaders who order war crimes, but with individual military personnel who execute war crimes. So the question of nuclear use in Ukraine, in my judgment, is not going to go away. It will be difficult to, to deter um, Putin. But as we try, we need to think through how to deter others in the Russian decision-making apparatus.
That's not an easy thing or a sure thing at all, but I think it's the best strategy that we can take right now. So we have just a few minutes for some final questions or comments, and I'm very much looking forward to the final remarks. Cool. Um, so we have uh, just under 10 minutes, so I'm gonna take a couple from in the room and then Scott can respond, and then we'll wrap up and then have lunch. So uh, first question is right here, please. Hi, sir. Uh, Gleb Spirnov, I'm one of the Pony Scholars. Um, so I would like to start off with an assumption. Uh, I, I agree with your overall outlook. Uh, in fact, this is something I'm kind of pondering currently myself. Uh, the only question I would have would be if one single low-yield nuclear weapon was used, would that not set a precedence and break taboo, establish credibility, and then also back down potential reinforcements? And likely this would occur in a geopolitical or strategic environment that is rapidly degraded um, by perhaps Ukrainian forces, so a Russian degradation in forces, and this, as this would occur as a last stand effort, but would somehow potentially not to use the word balance, but balance the odds in some setting. Thank you, sir. Question, another question? Um, yep, right here, please. Hi, I'm Stephen from GW. Uh, my question will be like, um, I think it was, um, uh, damn, I forget. It was an article on Foreign Affairs, basically uh, um, asking a question, what to do, what is to be done after, say, Putin really uh, used nuclear weapons in Ukraine? Um, and the, the also provide like three potential like uh, on our policy choices, including the minimum, which is no response. The uh, medium option, which is sort of a, we conventionally intervene, militarily intervene NATO in, in Ukraine. And the third, of course, is like nuclear response. So this, uh, obviously there are um, thoughts to be shared on how to deter Russia from using the, those weapons in the first place, but uh, could you share any thoughts on, on like, how would, you, uh, would we respond, uh, assess the uh, pros, and, pros and cons um, in the like, eventuality that Putin really used? Yeah, I think it was uh, Richard Bezos. Oh, Thank you. And I think we'll do one more. Yeah, Carlos. Hi. Um, my question is about sanctions and wondering if there, um, what, uh, if any additional measures would be uh, effective on, on an economic trade restriction. Um, in, in response to uh, any further developments in Ukraine. Okay, Th three great questions, um, and I'll try to give uh, uh, just a brief, brief comment. On the first, the effects of Putin's use of a single weapon on the broader international security regime or the future of nonproliferation depends, in my view, on two things. One is whether you think that there is a taboo against nuclear weapons use, and, or whether you think there's just a tradition of self-interest because of concerns about setting a precedent that could come back to haunt you, the debate that I've been having, for example, with Nina Tannenwald in recent years. If there really is a taboo that's based on moral, uh, fundamental, ethical beliefs, breaking a taboo often creates a revulsion. If there's a tradition and it's more a self-interested concern about precedent, it actually is more problematic in some ways if there's an initial use. So that gets me worried. But the second factor is not just your conception of whether it's a taboo or precedent, but because is it effective? And to me, just as I think it's important that we help Ukraine win in a way that at least Putin potentially feels pressured to back down and accept a much compromised peace. If he uses nuclear weapons, I think it's very important that that not help him win the war. And how we should respond then for it depends on what can do that. And here, it really goes back to the second question. Um, it, I've got a simple answer, it, it depends. It depends on what kind of nuclear use you're talking about, right? But here I'm slightly reassured by the reporting of Fred Kaplan uh, who in the bomb reports on a um, high-level war game during the Second Ob 
Obama administration in 2016, in which it wasn't a Ukraine scenario, it was a scenario of a, yeah. Well, it was an invasion from Russia into the Baltics, in which Russia uses a single nuclear weapon when they get bogged down. And the deputies, after debating this issue, chose to respond by using a conventional attack, presumably on the base or related bases from which Russia had launched the attack on NATO. The principles, but using conventional weapons only. The principles said, no, we have to respond to a nuclear attack with a nuclear attack. When told by the red team that that would mean that Russia is likely to engage against the United States, they said, oh, well, let's use nuclear weapons but attack Belarus. And that's what they chose. Uh, I think if Kaplan's reporting is right, that uh, it's important to note that uh, uh, Avril Haines uh, was one of the deputies, uh, Colin Call was one of the deputies, and Haynes reported he made t-shirts that said something like the deputies rule or the deputies had the right idea. And I think they did. Um, and the last point on sanctions, it, to me, I, th I think deterrence requires we should remember the threat of something worse to come. And so I think it is important when we think about sanctions to, to say, yeah, something worse could happen. And you could also think of lots of things sh short of military direct engagement, like blockades, or sabotage that could be threatened on top of sanctions. So I think when we talk about integrated deterrence, we have to think about integrated responses and not all of them need to be nuclear. My greatest concern that I see around Washington very often is that the nuclear strategists often lean too much on the nuclear swords that they've been studying and that they have responsibilities for rather than think through some of the many other things that we could do both to help deter this and to punish Russia in a more effective but de-escalatory manner. I'll conclude there. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Scott. Also, I, I, have, I found the slides really helpful because sometimes we forget what Putin has actually said. And going back to that and re kind of um, reacquainting ourselves with po what Putin actually says and the strategic landscape that we're living in, I think is really important. Thank you all so much for coming in person. Thank you to everybody who joined online. Um, if you haven't already checked it out, either um, out there on Amazon, wherever you buy your books, or uh, with the version online that Scott mentioned, please do uh, look at the fragile balance of terror, uh, really excited that we were able, that CSIS and Pony were able to be a part of this. Um, two last things for me. Um, second to last is to thank the Pony team um, and also the um, American Academy team. Doreen is out there, I think. Um, thank you, Doreen, for everything. Um, and also thank big thanks to Lachlan and Jess for everything to get everybody here. Um, thanking you all for your really phenomenal questions, for being so involved, for the nuclear scholars. I hope that this was an enjoyable first morning uh, on your program. And the last thing to do is to invite you to join us for lunch, which will be served right out there. Um, but that concludes our programming. And thank you all again so much for participating today.